Hey everybody, this week's episode of the r r Show is brought to you by Floodgate Games. And hello, Ruel. How are you doing? I am doing fantastic, my friend. How's it going? And more importantly, what the heck is on your table? I'm glad you asked. Wow, you didn't waste any time at all. Uh, I have a very big old game (laughs) on my table, which I have to admit, I am very fond of. Uh, This is Fog of Love. Now, have you ever played Fog of Love? I have not, but I've heard so many great things about it. I'm, I'm, uh, that's why I was so excited to see it on your table. I was like, look at this uh, setup here. I'm curious. Let's hear about Fog of Love. You and Michelle are going to love this game. Although it doesn't have to be like you know couples who can play it. I mean, you and your daughter could play the game as well. Although maybe it'd be a little bit weird. Because this game patterns itself after a romantic comedy turned into a board game. And that's what it is. Every time you set up the game, there is a plot with multiple chapters you're going to play through. The base game comes with, I think, three different storylines. We are in the one called I Know What I Want. And the whole thrust of this particular storyline is we are a couple, of, you know, a, a, a new romantic couple that met through an online dating app that focused on not having kids. We knew that's what we want. Neither of us want kids. And so we set out trying to build a relationship, learn more about each other, maybe fall in love, maybe live happily ever after. But waiting in the wings... A baby! Um, things could happen that lead to a surprise that will turn the whole thing on its ear. And the game, like I said, the base game comes with, like a, there's a childhood sweetheart one, and there's been several expansions that have come out. More expansions are coming, including Life and Lockdown. And um, so they give you the overall plot of the movie. But the way the game works is, first, we have our meet cute, where everybody makes their character. And in this case, Ruel, you are a teacher with long blonde hair, a squeaky voice, and you're very well dressed. That's who you are. You're this uh, strapping blue feller over here. Now, that's what I know about you, and that means you have high discipline, you're a curious person, but you lack a certain sincerity. Uh, you have, you're maybe even a little self-centered, maybe even a bit pretentious. Now, that's what I know about you right now, based on these starting cards. Meanwhile, me, I'm a chef. I'm lean, I wear leather gloves, and I have a sensuous voice, uh, which means I am really low. I'm, I'm a bit uh, thick-skinned. I'm not quite so sentimental. This is me down here. Um, I have a high sense of curiosity. Oh, and I'm missing something. Let's see here. I'm missing one. I also am disciplined. I'm a disciplined person as well. So we share this in common. We're both disciplined. We're both curious. You're an extrovert. I'm not sensitive. uh, And I'm maybe not the most sincere. Now, this is what we know about each other at the beginning of the game. And we're going to try to make this relationship last. Here's what we don't know. Each player gets three secret traits. Well, you're also a nurturing worry wart who's a little promiscuous. And oh. um, I do not know this about you, but this gives you secret goals you are trying to do throughout the game. Um, because you're a worry wart, you want our shared balance on sensitivity to be high, high, high. And you've got a problem, Ruel, because right out of the gate, I am not a very sensitive person. I'm, 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 I'm thick-skinned, calm, unsentimental. And, but as a worry wart, this is a secret trait that you are going to be trying to achieve for us as a couple over the course of the game. And if we do not achieve enough of our traits, it will not end well for our relationship. So that's the situation we find ourselves in. Meanwhile, me, oh, I'm, uh, I'm irresponsible, I'm relaxed, I'm pretentious. Uh, pretentious chef, who knew? <laughs> um, but anyway, right? so this is the situation we find ourselves in. We are trying to make it as a couple. And every turn, we've got a big old hand of cards. And uh, on your turn, you're going to pick one. So let's say, into this melting pot, I play my first card. Close your eyes, Ruel. Can you guess where I'm taking you tonight? And this becomes a communal goal that we both have to focus on. Each of us has a handful of these really cool, nice-feeling poker chips. And what we're going to do is we both read this. In this case, um, uh, we are trying to find out where are we going out tonight. We both secretly, simultaneously reveal whether it's a, a secret party with famous people or... I don't know. I lost track of where we're going. Or to the local square to listen to the street storyteller uh, sentimental love stories. And you can see, whichever one you choose, that's going to change your standing. That's going to make you more extroverted. Or it's going to drop your um, discipline, if you lost track of what it was. Or your um, sensitivity could increase. And so here's the deal. You might say, Ruel, based on... Remember... You're a worry wart. You want our group sensitivity. So we both reveal at the same time. And you reveal... Um, where is it? I can't find it. You choose yours. And meanwhile, based on my secret goals that you don't know, I pick, um, let's see, I would definitely say, oh, I don't know where we're going. I totally lost track. 
because I am irresponsible. So we reveal at the same time, and we're like, no! Because if we're in sync, if we can anticipate what the other person is going to do, we get a bonus. We fall more and more in love. So we've missed a chance. So that's bad. But we have definitely learned stuff about each other. Because I see, Ruel, that you want these sentimental love stories, so you put this over here, and that tells me we're in trouble. You must want more sensitivity in our relationship. And here's why that's a problem. Because I'm relaxed. I want our shared balance to go down. Oh. And that, and as soon as I see you do this, I'm like, oh my gosh. Is he going to work against... I mean, is this a relationship doomed from the start? You're a worry wart. I'm a chill, re- laid-back, relaxed person. Will this work? Um, as we answer more questions and learn more about each other, taken from these different decks, sweet questions, serious questions, or very dramatic questions, like later on, we might have a, an argument in a restaurant. Um, that can really change things up. Or, um, you know, hey, we run into one of our other exes. And how do we Ooh. deal with that? Or a nice simple thing like we, we compare celebrity free passes. You know, and, we, and as players, we actually put real people in these slots of, you know, who's <laughs> on our list and stuff like that. So there's two things going on here. This is a very fun, um, raucous role-playing game where you, you play the role that was given you by these cards, but we're also playing a strategic game where I don't know what you need, and I need to figure it out. Because each player in this one has two goals. I could be trying to go for um, a dominant relationship where I'm on top, or a love team. And if I can't make these happen, we lose. Right now, the thing is, we don't know if we're playing a cooperative game or a competitive game. Right now, you want to go for equal partners or love teams, so we've got more conflicts right off the bat. But over the course of the game, we might change. Our traits might change. We might evolve. I might say, I gotta let go of being relaxed, because Ruel just will not stop it with this. And so I gotta find a way to get a different trait. Um, Or, if I think this is never gonna work, because uh, I'm too invested in that, and we just keep butting heads, I might try to change and change the rules and go for an honorable exit um you know and and give Uh. up or maybe even a heartbreaking exit midway through this game this could go from being a cooperative game to a semi-cooperative game to even a competitive game as things evolve in truly thematic ways and again it's all based on the forward gameplay of paying attention to what your teammate or opponent, depending on how the relationship evolves, is doing and making smart decisions. Decisions that also tell a really fun and engaging, compelling, romantic comedy story. It is a miracle of design. I cannot recommend it highly enough. And everybody does. I mean, I think at the time, Shut Up and Sit Down said, this is the best game we've played in a long time. That was their quote. And I mean, both Jen and I were really blown away by it too. It's already gotten a bunch of expansions. There's two more expansions Mm -hmm. coming. The old expansions that are out of print are getting reprints. Um, And Floodgate Games, our sponsor, has picked it up. And, well, one lucky viewer of the R&R show is going to win a copy of Fog of Love. How do they do it? And And it won't be you. How they're going to do it? Yes, uh, what they're going to do is listen for the secret word. At some point during the show, when we're talking about the games that we're talking about, you're going to hear that secret word. And we want you to send an email with the name of the game to contest at rotto.com. And then you'll be entered into uh, a, a drawing uh, next week uh, for a copy of Fog of Love. Yep. And the secret word for this week, one of us will say it, is Rocky. R-O-C-K-Y, as in Rocky Road Ice Cream, or Rocky Balboa the Boxer. Or, or Rocky, being in a Rocky relationship. Rocky relationship, that's right. So listen to a secret word, and then whatever game, remember, not the, not the word itself, you need to type in the game title that we're talking about at the time that we mentioned Rocky into a, a email at contest at rado.com, as you see down below. There you go, yep, yep, yep. Uh, very cool game, just uh, so it fresh looks, and unique uh, and different. Two players only. Uh-huh. Yeah. So you know, yeah, it looks absolutely amazing, and um, I'm glad you're able to show that off because this is something that Michelle and I need to play ASAP. Um, I've had it. I've had a an older copy of it. I think I got it in trade uh, a while ago. Oh yeah. It just sat on the shelf. Yeah. Okay. And so, yeah. Um, I I need to play it. It sounds. I mean, just the whole you pitched it as a, a movie type game, and yep. I'm like, okay, if it's a romance, a rom com, you know, whatever. Exactly. I, I'm. Yeah, we're into it. So yeah, that looks great. All right. Well, cool, cool, cool. Well, then we've got our business out of the way. We can do what probably most people have come here before. They want to hear us count, Ruel. They want to prove, yeah. can we do it? And we need to, you know, yeah. clop with our hooves and whatnot. And what we're counting is a continuation. Last week we started our the R&R Top 100 Games of All Time, and we are going to continue it today. Um, 
And for folks who yeah. watched last week and made their voices very strongly heard, there will not be a return of the celebrity mashup name Rudo. People did they not like that, Ruel. Well. They did. They did not <laughs> care for for Raël or Rudo. They said, "Can you please yeah. just call it the R and R Top 100?" Um, that yeah. was almost overwhelming. There were a few holdouts who yeah. I, I think had a lightness of uh, of spirit, perhaps. But yeah, most people did not want to hear about Rudo's Top 100. <laughs> Right. And we give the people what they want. So exactly. it is the R&R top 100. Yep. Yeah. So what we're doing, folks, um, I, we each have, uh, we, we each have, you know, top two, 300 games. We've taken our, the best of the best that each of us loves. We've mashed them into one list. We've sent that list to a friend of ours who adjudicates and makes sure we don't have any overlaps. And every week for the next... Uh, what is going to be this week in what eight more weeks? I guess seven more weeks. Yeah. We will be yeah. um, just counting down till we get to the best game of all time. And you can think of this as well. Hey, if you think of it in terms of fog of love, um, you know, you know, Rel and I. I mean, you know, we're in a relationship together, sort of. This show brings us together, yeah. and this is yeah. our couple version of a top 100. And uh, last week's was fantastic. Ruel really surprised me with some very good ideas. I hopefully I surprised him a couple of times. But yeah, we're going to continue yeah, with number games. 90, which I think is your picking up right number 90 i am i am selected yeah so here we are with the top 100 games of all time according to the r and r show uh we're gonna start off with number 90 this is this one surprised me in, in a very good way it's okay. a newer game okay and it's dice miner from atlas games <gasps> oh um, this literally just came out last year and i have been raving about this game since i've gotten it um a viewer on my twitch channel sent me a copy because i couldn't track it down and he was kind enough to send a copy it is absolutely fantastic. It's a dice drafting game um, at its heart. You can see, oh, that's when Amanda Penn and I played it. Um, you're taking dice off this little 3D mountain, and it's set collection. So each turn, you're just taking one die. Uh, there is one special uh, rule where you can only take dice that are not com covered by any other dice. So basically the top of the little mountain. Okay, so However, you get more options as, the, that... as it counts down, right. Correct. And then if, if you have a die with a beer on it, you can roll it, say cheers, and give it to your opponent, which allows you to break the rules. So now you can take two dice, and they can have um, dice on top of them as well. So that's the one way to break the rule. And there are different types of set collection. Uh, the blue dice let you re-roll dice. Uh, the green dice um, let you either keep dice for the next round, or you can uh, protect yourself against the black dice, which are the hazard dice. The hazard dice are dragons and cave -ins. Those are negative points. But on the green dice, if you have a shield or a pickaxe, then it turns into no positive um, positive points. And if you have multiples of those, it's a multiplier. So it's a really neat, neat set collection game. It play You play three rounds, and no game I've ever played has taken more than 20, 25 minutes. It's wow. wonderful. And every turn has a great decision where, okay, do I want to take this die or this die? And then do I want to spend my beer dice to give my opponent a die, but I get two dice at once. And then you can see there as well, the uh, on screen there, you have different characters. Each one has different abilities, which is basically an ongoing die, like a virtual die as well. Yeah. And at the end of the game, you're going to score. Now, one thing I did, I need to mention the tunnel dice. Those are the dice that are numbered one through five, uh, sort of like Yahtzee. You're trying to uh, get those in straight. So okay. one, two, three, four, five, and you get the added value of that. So one, two, three, four, five, I believe is like 15 or no, 20 points. Uh, so you want to complete as many straights as possible. And what's cool, this is my favorite part. After each round, you take all the dice and you re-roll them and you're going to add those to your next round. So by the end of the game, you have you each have this big mountain of dice that you're going to score points on. Oh, it's so, so much fun. And it really surprised me. I didn't expect this game to really be that, that, not, uh, that fun, honestly. But it is. I played it at least a dozen times with various people and we've all loved it. That's why it's our number 90 game, Dice Mike. I am incredibly jealous. I have wanted to play this game for a long time. Um, mm -hmm. I, I just love everything about the idea here. I mean, I love the presentation. I love the 3D nature. I, as I was watching yeah. the video, it looked like there must be some things you can do that let you take dice from below so that things slide down. So there's a, uh, yes. you know, a very that's cool a, 3D element the... to it too. Yeah, so when you uh, spend the beer dice, you're giving it to your opponent. You say, cheers, you roll the beer die, and it could come up on a face that they need, but then you get to take two dice, and that's when you get to break the rule where you can take dice from the bottom of the mountain. Oh, and, and oh like my that. gosh, I love it's that. It's so good. 
Yeah, yeah, you're gonna. I, I think you're gonna love it. Um, everyone I played it with absolutely raves about it. Actually, after Amanda played it, I think she went out and tried to order a copy. She she might have it by now. So, yeah, wonderful game. That's number ninety, Dice Miner. Okay, that is a great start. I mean, this is something we, we we're both gonna be at the Dice Tower West convention. I want to play this there. That that I'm that is. It. You have I'm it's been it. on my list for a long time. You have just you know rocketed to the top of my must play list. Definitely, yeah, definitely. Yeah. We're, we're, we're playing it, man. Cool, cool, okay. cool. All right. So that's number 90. Let's move on. I like it. Let's move on then to number 89, The Isle of Sky from Chieftain nice. to King. And so oh my goodness, I love this one so much. Uh, I mean, no surprise. And I heard you whispering, yes, nice. So I think you like Good. it too. Fantastic choice, yes. Oh man, Alexander Fister. And it's interesting, in this one, I'm so sorry, he had a co-designer on this one. I do not remember the name of. Uh, you know, Normally he flies solo, but maybe he should co-design more often because this is easily one of his best designs to date. This is a tile laying game, and I love laying tile. I, I can't get enough of laying tile. In fact, um, you know, uh, the last one we had from the last episode, my last entry was a tile land game. This is a tile land game. I got more tile land games coming. This is one of the best ones ever. Because what's interesting about it is you start every round, and we're trying to lay tiles to, you know, basically design our own version of the Scottish Highlands. But at the start of a round, you have three tiles. You put them in front of your shield, and behind your shield, you end up um, declaring how much you value those. How expensive is this tile and this tile? Uh, gonna be. And then you also pick one tile to say, okay, no one can buy that tile. That tile is literally getting axed. It's an axe symbol. Once everybody has made that tough, tough choice about what the values of these tiles are, you reveal, and then your opponents get to pay the money you specified to buy the tiles away from you. And that is creates such interesting and agonizing tension. I want, I mean, it, because if somebody doesn't buy it, then the money I put down is what I pay to get this. But when I say, I want this tile and I'm willing to play three coins, if you want that tile and I think you've got three coins, well, then maybe I should make it be four coins. Um, because depending, if you want it bad, then I'll make you pay more. And then if you decide, oh, I don't want that, then I gotta pay the four coins. So, it's, it's, I don't know what the term is. I'm sure there must be some kind of auction term for this, but it really yeah. just turns everything on its head. Where you're kind of a storekeeper and you're hoping people don't buy your wares so you can buy them. Or you're hoping, oh, please buy my wares, because I don't want to buy them at the ridiculous price I set for myself. And then that's only half the game. Once you eventually get your tiles, you're doing all the typical carcassonne style tile stuff stuff, but the other half of this game is there's a brilliant objective system where every time you play, there are, what is it, um, four different objectives, and each one of them is going to trigger in different combinations at the end of every round, and these objectives will trigger multiple times. In the first round, the first objective goes. In the second round, the second one. In the third round, the first objective and the third objective score. So you are constantly making really tough long-term decisions about what's important. And every time you play, it's a different combination of really interesting objectives, too. I mean, this is one of the best tile lane games of all time. This is one of the best Alexander Pfister games of all time. It's got a great presentation. It's so good, it's gotten a lot of expansion content that takes it from being just like a nice little tight Carcassonne Plus into a really big, heavy, complex game. But no matter how you slice it, uh, uh, number 89, Isle of Sky, from Chieftain to King, is fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. 100% agree. Love this game. And... Um, as you said, it's Carcassonne Plus. It's uh, probably uh, Alexander Fister's one of his most accessible games. I, yes, I, feel I like. would agree. And yeah, and what you know, it's funny while you're going through the description, it just it sort of like just popped in my head what the whole tension of like, okay, I want someone to buy this at this price, but I sort of want to keep this. It, that little tension reminds me a little bit of Furnace, where you're going mm. to different spots in Furnace. And like sometimes you want the resources, but sometimes you really want you'd rather buy the the card itself or the the company. It's got a little bit. Of that. I mean, totally two totally different games. But oh, I, I love this game so much. I actually learned this game. Uh, fun fact: years ago, uh, right before they started doing online content from Monique and Naveen of uh, Before You Play. Oh yeah, yeah, um, we, yeah. We met up at a local media meetup, and they they taught me that game, and I I absolutely loved it. I actually, they might have started their channel at that point, but they were nowhere near as big as they are yeah. now. So. Oh yeah, they've exploded. Oh, such a wonderful game. Yeah, oh yeah. So Gr great channel for a great game, but yes. apparently not as great as our number 88. What's next, Terrell? 88 is... Come on, please. Lord. Our, our number 88 is Lords of Waterdeep. Uh, now, I'm going to preface this by saying okay. I put this on this list 
with um, sort of like, you know, I would include the expansion uh, Skulls of uh, Skullport with okay. it. Um, I just, yeah, I, I, I were the base game. I, I include it because it's such a classic. It is, you know, a worker placement game at its heart and it's got D and D. So I it brings, I I've seen this happen where it brings D and D fans into board games. Whereas, you know, if they're strictly role playing games, uh, gamers, they see this, they they're familiar with uh, water deep and all that. And they come on over. It's like, Hey, let's play some, let's play a board game. It's like, Oh, I recognize this. So I think it's done a lot to bring RPGers into the board gaming space. And I just, I just love this game. I think it's so well uh, crafted. Um, you are, you know, the lords of Waterdeep and sending out uh, groups of adventurers to complete your missions. You're gathering resources to complete those missions. And with the Skull or Skullport, uh, was it Skull? I always uh, Skulls of Skullport, I think. Skulls of Skullport, Scoundrels, something like that. It's a tough one to say. <laughs> the Scoundrels of Skullport, yes. Scoundrels uh, of Skullport. two right. different books. Scoundrels of Skullport. Uh, it adds a board on top and also on the bottom so you can, you know, uh, uh, you have more spaces to compete for. I just think it's a wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, design and a great example of worker placement where mm. they took, um, you know, the worker placement, um, say, of like uh, Stone Age and just added, made it chunkier and a little more meaty. Um, and this is actually a really good gateway uh, worker placement games. I, I feel like Stone Age would probably be my choice for a gateway, but this one, I just have a lot of great memories of playing this with uh, friends at my local game night and just, you know, a wonderful game where you do have a little bit of take that. That's one thing you got to be careful. Some of those missions, the a quest or whatever they're gonna stick so you can stick people with certain ones that sort of hose them uh, overall but overall it's a fantastic worker placement game that's why it's our number 88 lords of water Deep. excellent choice excellent choice i completely agree and in all honesty i think the game stands on its own even without the scoundrels of skull port expansion i think it's okay. a worthy entry for our top 100 uh because nice. i mean this is maybe the ultimate gateway worker placement game you said hey for D fans how about game of throne fans how about you know yeah. lord of the rings fans anybody yeah. who has ever shown any interest in any fantasy type stuff uh, in your life, any kind of pop culture, they are going to enjoy this game. And what's so cool about it is the interaction between players, uh, both because, hey, over the course of the game, the city gets built by us, and we create more worker placement spaces that everybody else can go to, and then we get dividends. But more importantly, my favorite, some of my favorite cards in all of board gaming are in this game. The ones where when I play an event, it says, oh, I get something, and now I have to give something to one of my opponents. And I love those moments. It's great for a multiplayer yeah. game. When I was like, give it to me, give it to me, and all that kind of stuff is great. <laughs> uh, really brilliant, brilliant game. Um, and, oh, and by the way, you mentioned it can get a bit cutthroat. The interesting thing is the designers have gone on record saying that the mandatory quest, that's what you're talking about, they yeah, were literally right, yeah. added in the 11th hour. And as far as they're concerned, it doesn't hurt the game at all just to remove them entirely. Oh, which is okay. what Jen and okay. I do. Uh, if you, if you yeah. just want to truly live and let live where all interaction is positive between players, remove the mandatory quest games and you've got a Care Bear Wonderland with nice. uh, nice. number 88, Lords of Waterdeep. Good call, good oh. call. Cool, thank you. All right, let's move on then to our number 87 on the list. I am not done talking about Tile Air, folks. Let's talk about Miyabi. Oh my goodness. Whoa. I love Miyabi yes. so much. From Haba Games, which... Uh, hardcore gamers might say, wait, Haba Games? What are you talking about? Don't they just make games for, like, you know, little kids? And, uh, yes, they certainly do. But every mm -hmm. once in a while, Haba Games will release a, uh, richer, heavier game. I think they call them their family line or something like that. Uh, where, you know, they, they've got Gateway or Gateway Plus style games. And that is definitely where Miyabi fits. This is... One of my favorite tile laying games of all time from one of my favorite designers of all time, Michael Kiesling. And, uh, I mean, yeah, Michael Kiesling has been on fire for the last few years. And, of course, everybody loves him so much for Azul. But forget about Azul. Uh, Miyabi kicks Azul to the curb because this is an incredibly simple, beautiful, elegant little tile laying game where every round there's a whole bunch of tiles you can grab and these are kind of polyomino shaped pieces and all the tiles have different elements on them uh, bushes flowers some of them have pagodas some of them are rocky you never know what you're going to find but when you take one of them the element that's on the tile indicates what row it has to be in. So like if you're looking on screen, I just put a little uh, elbow shape uh, and the uh, the bushes of that one had to be on the, you know, I, I, that, that determines what row I place it in. But um, at the same time I'm doing that, I'm also determining what column it was in. And now that I've placed that tile there, I cannot put anything else in that, in that column for the rest of the round. And uh, that may not sound like much, but oh my gosh, 
That simple, simple rule is so incredibly, mind-bogglingly tension-filled. Because as you go, and your field gets fuller and fuller and fuller of tiles, and it gets tougher and tougher to get tiles laid out to be able to achieve whatever you're trying to do as you're laying all these puzzly things out. But you can never blame the game. It's your 100% your fault. I, I use this column. It's my fault I can't go there again until everything gets cleared out. And um, that's just the beginning, because another thing I love about this game is it, this is not only a, this is not a two-dimensional tiling game. As you go on, you will lay tiles on top of other ones, and you will build higher and higher and higher. And by the end of the game, even though these are flat tiles, you really feel like you've made a wonderful, gently rolling valley of gardens and all kinds of things to see. Um, this game is uh, you know one of the the most uh, deceptively deep games there is. It seems so simple. I could teach you how to play this game in under two minutes, and you would know everything you need to know. But um, as you, the longer you play, the more you will just... Ah! Oh, why am I going to fix this problem that I created for myself? As you uh, try desperately to build the most beautiful gardens you can in number 87, Miyabi. One of my favorite tiling is all oh, yeah. time as well. You, you described it perfectly, deceptively deep. Yes. Um, like like you said, I learned the game in two minutes, just like you said. And I was like, oh, okay, this is, to me, I was like, oh, it's just number nine, but uh, with a little more stuff going on. No, it's way more than that. It is so, so deceptively deep, you said. I, Michelle and I love this game. She actually, fun fact, um, when a lockdown first happened because of COVID, um, Michelle actually painted one of the, uh, like a, a Miyabi-esque um, uh, thing with her watercolors. Oh, um, wow. It, it came out, yeah, like a Miyabi-ish like, landscape. It was uh -huh. really neat. Now, one thing I got to say, though, uh, I, I wish the art was a, a different style. I don't know, for whatever mm. reason, the art didn't really do it for me, but the gameplay more than made up for it. It's uh, You know why you feel choice. that way? Because it's got uh, one of the most beautiful box art covers you've ever seen. Yeah, and then yeah. the game, and you open and the game, it's like, oh, yeah, that looks okay. <laughs> um, yeah, and that's that's exactly what it is. Like that box cover, and they, I, that might have been what Michelle watercolored. But oh, yeah, once you open the box, like, yeah, it, yeah. it's like it's okay. Uh, it's but a fair point, but the reality play. is, once you start playing that game, you don't have time to think about what it looks like. You are just your yeah. brain is crunching so hard. And I didn't mention this, Holy. but if you feel like okay, I've mastered this game, no, you haven't, because I forget it comes like with almost a half a dozen different little modules you can yeah. turn on that makes it even yep. deeper and richer and more heavy yeah. and complex. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, folks uh, that aren't aware, like, be sure, do not sleep on Haba as far as, like, you know, strategy yeah. games go, because, you know, there are a couple of titles. Um, Miyabi is one of them. I, I can think of a few more, but Miyabi is one that definitely, you know, it's not for, like, little kids. You mm -hmm. know, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful game. Yep. All right. Great choice. Let's move on to number 86. Let's do and, it. you know, you were just talking about um, tense decisions. This one is full of them. Number 86 is Freedom, the Underground Railroad. <sighs> okay. And this is, we've talked about this game before. Yes. Uh, we did a cooperative list together. It's one of my all time, if, I mean, it's up there for me, cooperative games, uh, one of the great ones of all time. Um, you are trying to help uh, free slaves during, you know, um, the uh, in the US uh, back when slavery was still a thing. You know, I, I get like, I, I we talked about this before, like it's, you literally get emotional playing this game. Um, because uh -huh. there's no way around it. You are going to lose slaves, and those yep. are human lives. You know, I'm getting a little choked up right now just talking mm -hmm. about it. Uh, it's a cooperative game, so you and the your fellow players, and you could solo it as well, uh, you're trying to move um, uh, slaves across the border to Canada to safety. Yes. And you're going to do that through, you know, uh, cooperative gameplay. It's a card-driven game. You, could, you have abolitionists that will help you out. Um, and you're trying to, you know, those are all slave catchers there. Uh, they've abstracted it to these little colored cubes and everything, but still, it, it can be brutal. Uh, I'm not going to lie, I don't play this game regularly, but it's a brilliant design. I mean, it's just, it's tough when you really think about it. It, it really, it hits uh, on all cylinders as far as emotion, emotions go. But, I mean, look at that. You have the different abolitionists that give you different uh, abilities. You're going to gain money to help support your cause. And hopefully, you're going to get as many slaves across the border as, as necessary for the win condition. Uh, but there's no two ways around it. You are going to lose lives. Oh, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's... Yeah, that, it's, it's, I mean, it's it's a great, great cooperative game. One of the most um, emotional and uh, hard-hitting themes that I've ever played, if not the most hard-hitting theme I've ever played. I don't know how you can top game. it. Yeah, and that's why I put it, uh, we put it at our number 86 for the R&R &R Top 100, Freedom, the Underground Railroad. Yeah, I, I completely agree 100%. It's really interesting, too, because if you just look at it, if you didn't know what it was, you'd think, oh, this is just some kind of abstract game. You're moving... 
colorful yeah. little pawns around and there's little cubes and there's other pawns that get in your way. Um, and I think that was a choice that was made deliberately by the developers to try to kind oh, yeah. of look, okay, just appreciate this as a game. And that's one thing. And, and you can definitely do that. But the, the thing is the actual card you're playing, they all have, um, you know, they're, they're all based on real historical people, real historical mm -hmm. events. And this game, for me personally, was so eye-opening. You know, the first time, I think it was actually, I was filming a run-through of this, and I was reading the card devoted to the Dred Scott case, I think, on camera. Mm -hmm. And I almost broke down crying. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because, I mean, I, I, I was tangentially aware of it, but putting it in the context of the world at that moment and feeling all those, and making those choices, uh, you know, those compromises, is where, okay, well, for, for the, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. To ensure more people can survive, we have to sacrifice these lives over here. Um, and so you've got this kind of abstract area movement route building game going on, but at the same time, you've got an incredibly evocative and incredibly moving history lesson playing out in front of you. This game, I think, would be fantastic for civics classrooms around the country, yes. for, uh, for, for the next generation to learn um, you know, to, to be able to approach it and, oh, look, this is just a game. But, you know, if you start reading that flavor text and you start absorbing what's actually going on here under the surface of these colorful emotions, it's, it, it's an incredible journey. I mean, both my wife and I found it, yeah. it incredibly harrowing. Um, and it's, yeah. it's a brave game. It's an important game. It's a work of art. It's, it's almost, I, I, hate, I, I, I'm a, a yeah. loathe to call it a game as opposed to a work of art that illuminates history in a new and valuable way. I think I absolutely 100% agree. And uh, as you said, uh, you know, it would be a perfect game for a civics uh, a class. And they've actually, uh, you know, when I, I talked to the designer and um, the the company Academy Games a couple of years ago, Dice Tower West, oh, yeah. and uh, they actually gave me, they let me know that it is used in uh, one uh, school district in New York, and they have a supplemental book that goes wow. with it. And I actually have a copy of it, and it really dives even deeper into the history. So. I mean, it literally is used in in schools. So, um, yeah. Well, that's it's, fantastic. It's absolutely wonderful. But yep. that's our number 86, Freedom, the Underground Railroad. Okay. Well, that was a heavy topic. Uh, let's yeah. go to uh, maybe a slightly lighter one, although I am still not done talking about tile layers, folks, because number All 85 right. on the list is Glenn Moore. Oh, my goodness. <sighs> uh, you know, and honestly... For my money, I, I still think this might be the greatest tile layer of all time. And I should say, when I call tile layer, I'm talking about games that are just all about laying those tiles. Uh, I, I will have other games on the list that I will be talking about in the future that have tiles, but there are other games, there are bigger games that do some tile laying. This is just a pure tile laying exercise is so brilliant. There is so much going on. Interestingly, uh, twice in this list, we're talking about um, laying tiles to you know build out the Scottish Highlands. I'm not quite sure how that happened, but uh, I guess it's just a really rich source material, but they, you know, the this game, uh, we're drafting tiles, we're placing them in our own little uh, fiefdoms in front of us, and the brilliant thing about this game, this is a tile-laying engine builder, because each tile you build can produce goods or convert goods into other goods or do various and sundry effects, and when you take a tile and you decide where you're going to put it on your little building fiefdom, uh, you, you activate that tile and every tile it's adjacent to. So every new tile becomes fuel that feeds your existing tiles. And that means you need to be building so smartly and thinking so long term about, right, okay, because you can see like the next 20 tiles that are available. And you, okay, if I put this here and I leave this slot available, if I can get that tile that's like, I don't know, 15 turns away from me right now and slot it in, that will be the perfect one, two, three combo and they'll all just trigger off each other and it'll be massive. And then you think, oh, well, then there's no way you're going to get that, right? Because everybody else can see that and they're not going to let you have it. This is a drafting game. The other brilliant half of this game is the drafting of your tiles is done on a time track, uh, which is to say, let me um, go on ahead and show the time track. What happens is, let me move my big fat hand. You can see all those tiles that are coming. 20 was a bit large, more like 12. You can see the next 12, or is it 10 or 12 tiles? And if you see one way off in the distance, way off in the future you need, you can just jump right ahead, skip the queue, and you know, jump 
five or six turns into the future and grab that because you know how important it is for that little combo you've made for yourself. Here's the problem, though. If you jump really far ahead like that, that means all the other players who you left behind, they will get to take multiple turns before you ever get to go again because it's whoever's at the end of the track um, gets to go. And you know, So if I jump really forward to get that perfect tile, I have given a huge bounty to my opponents. And the beautiful thing in a two-player game, there's basically a virtual opponent, a special die that only has um, ones and twos on it that will move forward and take tiles in a kind of semi-predictable way. The game is brilliant. The tiling is world-class. The engine building, one of the best engine builders of all time. The time track makes it all hum and purr and sing so well. There's also a really strong economic engine as well, because you can be generating resources to run your engine, or to sell them at market, uh, or getting coins so you can buy stuff at market that you don't have another way to generate. And the interesting thing is, the stuff that's in the market was put there by other players. So there's this indirect um, you know, connection between players. We're all working together. And now on top of that, you've got meeples that you are trying to move around from tile to tile as well, or graduate them so they can be big scoring things. And there's objectives uh, that players are racing to be the first to complete as well. I mean, there's it's it's absolutely amazing. From um, what is it? Uh, Matthias Kramer, one of the best designers of all time, and I say that largely off the strength of this game. Although he's done a lot of other really brilliant designs too, Lancaster, Helvetia, um, you know, uh, 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 Watergate. Uh, but for me. Glenn Moore, oh man, it takes the cakes. Just one of the absolute best of all time and our number 85 on the list. Wow, wow, wow. I well, Wasn't this game out of print for a while? It and, was out of print. Um, and what's happened, I should have mentioned this. You're, I'm glad you mentioned. Mm-hmm. Uh, Glenn Moore 2, recently funded yeah. really well on Kickstarter, was a big monster mm-hmm. hit. And don't get me wrong, I love Glenn Moore 2 as well. Uh, and in fact, mm-hmm. Glenn Moore 2 basically takes Glenn Moore and just adds so much new stuff. Uh, tons and tons of content from lots of really well-known designers. So arguably, I would say almost objectively, it's the superior game to get. But mm-hmm. um, th- I think I still prefer the original Glenn Moore because of a few key design decisions that were made that were okay. kind of streamlined out to add complexity elsewhere in Glenn Moore 2. I don't consider Glenn Moore 2 to be just kind of like an expansion. It feels like a different beast to me uh, because it okay. added this whole area majority board where players are vying for control and dropped one of the most important um, tactical decisions you have to make when you're actually laying out stuff to, to kind of make room. I, I, I would recommend either, but if you if I had to pick one, I'd probably pick Glenmore over Glenmore 2, but both of them are fantastic. Uh, I guess yeah. you can say this is kind of a shared entry at number 85. The Glenmore, whatever Glenmore you can get your hands on, quite frankly. Nice, nice. Yeah, I was I was always curious about that because I, I didn't uh, follow up on Glenmore 2. Like, I wasn't sure if it was just a standalone game, a sequel, a redo, or if you could get Glenmore 2 and still play, like, the original Glenmore. But it sounds like... It's a, no, it's a different piece. I would things. call Glenmore 2 okay. a proper sequel. You know, a lot of times games say, oh, I'm game 2 in the series. And it's like, you're like no, you're the same game with just, like, a little bit of expansion content in. Glenmore 2, yeah, yeah. it's a new thing. Um, nice. we, we, you know, still keeping the heart of Glenmore. Yeah. All right. Right. So what's 84? Let's move on to a number 84 on our list. It is... A tie lane game? No. (laughs) I had to roll some dice. Kubitos. Oh, Um, there we go. Yep. A recent favorite. You know how much I love this game. Uh, Just a a, a quick overview of it would be, I would just call it, it's the Quacks of Quinlanburg, the dice version. That's what this is. Uh, You're basically pushing your luck every round in a race game. Yes. As you can see there, you're racing around the board, you and Jen, and you're doing it through the use of dice. You start with a standard dice, and it's a uh, bag builder, dice builder, uh, where you're going to generate income and movement income get you better dice and movement move you around the the uh, board there and it's a really neat um design again one of my favorite designers uh of of these days john d claire uh him and aeg they're knocking Mm -hmm. out of the park with all of their games Mm -hmm. and um so you can see there you roll uh dice you put them in the active slot then you use the active dice and you're gonna move into your discards there are also spots where you can trash dice you know get rid of your basic dice uh, that way you can, you know, have better odds to pull those really, really nifty dice. And what's great is all the different colored dice there, uh, they all have different abilities, and you could change those abilities from game to game. I think each one has like five different yeah. uh, variations on them. And then, as you can see, the board as well, you can flip that over. There's another board. I think there's like two or four boards. I believe he comes with four game. boards in the base game, yeah. Four boards, yeah. Four racetracks. And, um, 
Yeah, and then you also have that side track there, the fan track, where, you know, sort of like a makeup, if you get hosed on a turn where you push your luck too much and you uh, quote-unquote bust, mm -hmm. um, you don't get, you don't just lose your turn, you actually go move up on the fan track, which will give you, uh, like, the extra income or, um, I think, a additional die or whatever. So it, it's a nice catch-up mechanism. I love this one. Again, big hit in our household. Uh, we uh, Michelle and I love it, too. I played it, I think, at three and four. Just as wonderful. Um, that is why it's our number 84 game, Kubitos. I agree with everything you said. The variety of this, because all the dice are going to be in every game, but they all change function and different combinations of functions. Mm -hmm. And I've heard some people complain that, oh yeah, if you bust, because you're pushing your luck, trying to get the most you can out of your dice, if you bust, oh, the consolation you get on the, on the crowd, the stadium track, isn't worth it. Yeah. You're playing it wrong. Um, I yeah. will uh, often almost on purpose say okay oh, i don't care i almost want to bust because the higher you go up on that it can become so incredibly powerful if you get multiple yeah. busts um yeah. so sometimes like you know what i'm gonna be able to do this round i can't reach a space on the board that i really care about i'm gonna roll the dice i'm just gonna have a little bit of fun with it and see what i get because if i bust i'm almost happier for it um yeah, yeah everything about this design is so brilliant the production is great although i should say if you're looking at this on youtube okay. those cute little googly-eyed um racers on the track the game does not come with those those are some gamer glass <laughs> that my wife jennifer ham makes uh you can go to uh, gamerglass.art if you'd like to find out more those often appear in a lot of my videos uh the, the, the it's called cubitos because we're on a cube planet where there are cube animals engaging in their little cube be races um yeah and yeah it's sort of, sort it's of bizarre <laughs> yep yeah I, yeah the theme is sort of weird and like it sort of put me off at first i was like it looks like spongebob SquarePants on the cover and I'm like well, i don't really yes know it about very much game, does but... you are right yeah <laughs> but then when you actually play it it's like oh this is so good so 84 kubitos a wonderful dice builder bag building um race game i agree that is an Excellent, excellent entry, but not as excellent as our number 83, in my opinion, anyway. And I'm finally going to stop talking about uh, tile layers for a while. Um, and I know okay, you love rolling dice. So let's talk about number 83, role player. Oh, yes. You, you, I know you played this. I know you love this, love right? this game. There's yeah, no two ways about game. it. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Uh, this game is so brilliant. Um, the story it tells is the creation of a fantasy Dungeons and Dragons RPG type character where over uh, many, many rounds, we are drafting dice that will add up towards our strength, our dexterity, our, our constitution, our intelligence, our wisdom, and our charisma. Right? Yeah, the, the, the classic D&D &D stats. And uh, as part of setup, we end up getting a, a random so assortment of cards that indicate, you know, what uh, fantasy archetype we're going to be, you know, what our, uh, you know, what kind of race we have, what type of uh, personality we have, what type of class we are. And um, this gives us a bunch of targets. If I'm a halfling, I want to have high dexterity and I want to have low strength. Uh, and if I end, I mean, so um, when I'm drafting dice, I need to be very careful and get the right dice at the right time to hit all my target goals because the closer I can make the perfect halfling cleric, let's say, although that's just the start. Uh, you could be lizard monsters or, um, you know, elves. I mean, it, it, the uh, so much expansion content has come out. There are so many so much variety in just what you get to be in this game. As every round, you roll those dice, you put them up on the auction block or the drafting block, and then players take turns deciding which die they're going to take and where they're going to plug it in. Because every time you finish one of your attributes, you unlock a special power that will let you re-roll dice or swap dice around or do all kinds of things. This game is such an intricate puzzle. Uh, there's so many layer upon layer upon layers. Oh, and there's your... Uh, your um, um, Oh, what's it? Your alignment. You also have to, okay, am I uh, chaotic, yeah. good, or evil? There's so many things you're trying. You're trying to achieve all of these things to perfection. It's impossible to do them all, so you're really having to compromise. Okay, well, I guess I'll be good instead of evil like I'm supposed to, but say I'll be because this die is going to be perfect over here because it's going to unlock this. It's going to trigger a combo chain. And so the puzzle of drafting these dice and then building the perfect character is fantastic. But then there's the other half of the game, the draft itself. Um, when I first played this game years ago, was it like 2014, something like that? I think maybe this game came out, something. It's been out for a long time, or maybe maybe 2017. I'm not quite sure, but anyway, uh, to get the dice, we roll the dice, we put them on this kind of auction block, and we take turns grabbing them. 
This is entwined drafting. Long before it became all the hotness and all the rage these days that seems like every third game is an entwined drafting where, oh, whenever I draft something, I'm having to get something else, whether I want it or not. And this game was doing that a long time ago because every die you grab, not only is the die you need, it's not only a color you need, it's not only a value you need, but it's an initiative speed because the second half of a round is we can then buy equipment, learn spells, get um, you know uh, special tricks we can do on cards. And you desperately want to be, most of the time, the first player to grab one of those because you're set collection trying to get the perfect set of armor for your character or try to get um, a special skill that will um, dovetail perfectly into whatever your um, your alignment might be or whatever it might be. But what do you want to know? The, the die in the number one slot that would let you get items first? That's the last die you want. You want the die that's in the worst space or the die in the middle space. If I take that one, hey, I actually get extra money. Um, but then you as the second player get to decide, oh, am I going to go first? Which means I'll get first dibs on all the equipment. So the draft is really interesting very interactive. And I'll be honest, it can get a little cutthroat sometimes because it's usually pretty easy to see. Oh, that would finish your chainmail armor, wouldn't it? It'd be a real shame if somebody else took that and literally tossed it for some extra cash, wouldn't it? Oh, I'm afraid that's what just happened. Um, but you know what I mean? Jen and I live with it because, hey, that happened because I didn't value it properly and I put you in the spot where you could grab it before me. Everything about this game is great. It's wonderfully thematic. And I've always heard some people complain about, it's so frustrating um, because all you do is you create a character. And to me, it's so satisfying. Look at my character. This is ready to go out on adventures. And other people say, well, and so there have been expansions that actually allow your adventurers as you're building them to have little adventures and fight monsters. Yes. Those are nice if you want that. I have never felt a need for that at all. If you want to take yeah. these characters on adventures, what you want to do is get role player, um, what's it called? Role player adventures, I believe, which is a separate yeah. standalone game. You can create a new character here and then transport it into a big epic narrative uh, campaign game as well, which is super cool. Uh, the industry's never seen anything quite like that in terms of crossover. But all of the cool additional stuff that has come out after... I mean, so much stuff has come out because this is such a well-loved game. It is so brilliant. Wonderful production. Uh, it's just so satisfying and just, just incredibly crunchy and puzzly. Number 83, Role Player. Yeah, a huge hit for me and my gaming group and mm -hmm. everything you said about it is so true. I, I love um, how thematic it is. Yes. You know, when you're building up your stats and, you know, you literally are creating this character just like, as you would, you know, in D&D &D or any other RPG. And what I love too is that it's, uh, you talked about the interconnectivity of, of the universe. Like they've come out with role player. Uh, the, I think it's called Monsters and Mayhem. That's the one where you can like um, fight monsters or whatever. Yep. And then they have uh, role player adventures. They did Lock Up, which was a worker placement oh, game yeah. placed, mm -hmm. uh, in this world. And then they did the wonderful, one of the all time great roll and write games, Cartographers, based yep. in this world. So yep. everything fits together. Role player itself, though, stands alone. It is an absolutely wonderful puzzle game. I, I love this one as well. Cool. All right. But apparently not as much as our number 82. Yeah, numbered 82, we're speaking of uh, dragons and dungeons and monsters and yeah. all this yes, stuff. Yes, we are. This one does it in spades and then some. That's why it's our number 82, Clank Legacy <laughs> Acquisitions Incorporated. Yep. Now, I'm not going to spoil it for anyone because it's, it is a legacy game, but I can talk about Clank. Uh, it's a deck building game. Um, it is a push your luck game because you're trying to dive into the depths of the dungeon. But as you can see here uh, in Clank Legacy, uh, you're exploring this big, enormous world. Uh, there is another side of this board as well. And you're going to unlock things like in any other legacy games. You got stickers to put, you, you're going to destroy cards. Um, but it's a deck builder at its heart. You're uh, playing, you draw five cards, you're going to use some for movement. You'll use some for uh, perhaps currency or uh, for combat. You're going to fight monsters. You're going to, you know, uh, upgrade your items. You're going to collect loot and more. And I, I love the Legacy game because there's there were so many nice little surprises. It's got a really good narrative. And if you're familiar with Acquisition Incorporated, it's just straight out. There's just a lot of laughs. Like when I played this with my group, um, it was, I, you know, it's about 10 games or so. Yeah. We played it over the course of about a month, month and a half. And we had so many laughs during each game because there's a lot of humor in the cards and just the gameplay itself. And it's one of my favorite legacy um, uh, experiences of all time. And I think they did such a wonderful job with this because they kept the heart of Clank and what it makes it special with this uh, like dungeon crawly, push your luck, a deck building game. Mm -hmm. And they expanded on it. They made it better. And, oh, did my camera just uh, I don't know. Yeah, I can still hear you. You're good. 
Okay. Uh, it looks like my camera. You broke. have a new okay. device um, detected, apparently. Very exciting. Oh, okay. Exciting. Um, oh, no. I have a new device detected. I need to oh, tell okay. it to stop doing that. I... Don't switch. Right. Sorry. That was me. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, so, you know, what they did was just expand it, made it better, and included the things from acquisitions, acquisitions incorporated that were funny. And yeah. just, it's a hilarious a world with hilarious characters. And it, again, I don't want to spoil anything because I, I feel like anyone that's into deck building, uh, dungeon crawlers, and or acquisitions incorporated, you've got to play this game. It's so wonderful. Yeah. Great experience. That's why it's our number 82, Clank Legacy Acquisition. I concur completely. I don't know if you mentioned it, but Acquisitions Incorporated apparently is a very, very popular comic strip series. That is, yes. you know, a, a fantasy about bureaucrats in a fantasy world or something like that. And so, um, you know, the writers of that, which are basically the Penny Arcade artists and writers, worked with the Clank developers from Renegade to make, I would say, it, it is hard to argue this is one of the, uh, you, you, I don't think you can argue against this is one of the funniest board games that's ever been produced. It is repeatedly yeah. laugh out loud funny. And, you know, I mean, I, I don't say that lightly because, you know, it's easy to say, oh, I lol And you're like, no, maybe you just thought that was a wry chuckle or something like that. But no, Jen and I would often laugh out loud as we were reading the uh, story snippets of this game. And then, yeah, Clank has yeah. always been a great deck building, push your luck dungeon delver. And it just becomes better with this. And the important thing to bear in mind, folks, is after you have finished a legacy campaign, you don't throw it away. You don't burn it on a funeral pyre. You keep it because you now have a customized world that you and your friends have made that you can continue to play um, for Aphrodite. After we finished this, I got rid of my original version of Clank because I didn't need it. Why would I play oh. on that when I could play on a custom board that my wife and I made and have just as nice. much fun, but it's much more meaningful for us because this is our customized personal world. And um, and it's still compatible with other expansions and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, so I, I completely agree. Clank was always a fantastic game and this takes it so far above and beyond the next level. Good call, That's number eighty-two. Yeah. Ew. Okay. And let's. What's above eighty-two is um, eighty-one. What do we have for? I don't know if everybody would agree, but uh, for me, it's a no-brainer. Our number eighty-one. And this is maybe a little bit more um, esoteric. Maybe not as many people know of it, but that's a shame if that's the case. Because Kashgar Merchants of the Silk Road is so phenomenally brilliant. I. I mean, I. I, I cannot stress uh, enough just how much Jen and I love it. It's one of the best engine building games of all time. And um, what would you call it? I would almost say it's, we were just talking about Clank. I would say this is one of the best deck building games of all time because what we're doing here as merchants of the Silk Road, you know, trying to travel back from east to west and west to east, although really the travel is left out of it. I mean, we're just stopping at certain places on the Silk Road and using our caravan full of characters to generate resources to fulfill contracts in on the Silk Road itself. But the reason I call this an engine builder and a deck builder, even if you're looking at it, you might say, well, this doesn't look like a deck builder. This is actually three simultaneous deck builders at the same time. Because each player has a stack, th three decks in front of them. And unlike most deck builders where, oh, the deck is all shuffled up and ran, you don't know where everything is in it, you have each deck splayed out in front of you. You know at all times where every single card is in every one of your decks. And on every one of your turns, you are going to take one of the three cards that's at the top of one of your decks and activate it, and then that, de that one card gets buried at the bottom of that deck. And over time, you're getting more characters. You are adding them to one of these three decks. And the whole game is about trying to maintain perfect synergy between these three independent decks. Uh, because if you can, if, oh, you know, okay, I really want to use this one right now because it will generate resources that this other character desperately needs. The problem is that other character is buried three cards deep in their deck. So, you do not want to do this action until you can get that other character into position. But that means you are going to have to spend time, um, you know, messing around with that. Oh, and we're doing this again. Why? Oh, uh, stop. D don't switch. Discord, stop it. Stop it. Folks, in case you didn't know, we're actually filming this live. And, oh, I can click don't show me this again. All right, it won't show me that again. Why do you, why do you want to do that? Anyway, sorry about that. What was I just saying? Oh, Cash Car, Merchant of Sick Road. Um, trying to get all of your uh, three decks... Singing in perfect harmony, um, you know, getting the right characters into the right slots, but then that's not enough because when you add them to the deck, they're at the bottom of the deck. And it's going to take a while, several turns that you have to churn through everybody else. But you might have to, churn, you want to get to that character so bad, but that means you have to use characters that you have no use for right now. So it's all about building three parallel engines in 
deck format and running all of them at the same time. This game explodes in depth and complexity the longer it goes and the more rich. Because, of course, as you're building these decks, you're putting certain types of characters into certain places. You know, oh, those will work well together. Or, okay, no matter what, this deck is always just going to generate resources. Whatever it's doing, it's probably generating something that these other ones will do until, oh, the best one to put in here doesn't generate. Do I um, abandon what this deck was about? Do I start pulling people out of these decks and deck thinning them so I can get to other stuff faster? Do I keep lean decks that I just run through really fast? All the normal stuff you think about with a deck builder multiplied by three and no randomness at all. Everything is preordained. Everything is about long-term, very, very tough decision-making to make in number 81 on the list, Kashgar Merchants of the Silk Road. Whew. Wow. Wow. Great choice. I'm going to be honest, I've never played this uh, game before, yep. but just based on that whole, the three decks at once, that looks like something I'd be into. Um, I, I love that, you know, trying to get everything in the right order at the right time. And as you said, there's no randomness. So you're going to, you're going to see what you're going to see. And, um, I don't know why this just, uh, it never, it was never on my radar. Well, it's interesting. Reason. It originally was published only in Germany, only in Germany. Okay. And there's a lot of text oh. on these cards. And um, okay. I originally played it because there was a super fan who actually loved it so much. He translated everything, made his own Photoshop versions of all the cards, and then um, oh, you know wow. just put them up. Uh, you could go to like an online on-demand print store. And I printed out a copy of this game, and it cost me like 80 bucks uh, because it's oh, very expensive gosh. to do. And that's what I actually yeah. demonstrated. Years later, they finally brought out an English version. And um, yeah, I, it, it breaks my heart that it was not widely touted. I mean, you know, in the same way that last year, uh, you know, Furnace, I mean, you mentioned Furnace earlier, got so much love, yeah. and deservedly so. This game deserves yeah. that same kind of love. From designer Gerhard Hecht, one of the greats, this uh, game. If you like deck building, if you like engine building, if you like dry, dusty, euro -y style goods conversion stuff that just makes your brain catch on fire with just how puzzly it is, and that's what I love. Uh, you'll probably yeah. love number 81, Kashgar, Merchants of Silk Road. Nice. And phew, we Great did it. Well, Week Fantastic. two is in the bag. Yes. All right. So, did one of us say Rocky? I hope so. Um, I and hope I hope so everybody too. was able to hear us saying it, because if they did, as Ruel said earlier, you can send what game we were talking about when either Ruel or I said the word Rocky, send that as your subject to contest at rotto.com, and you will be entered to win the awesome Fog of Love from show sponsor, um, Floodgate Games. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I, th I think we've done it, and we'll be back... We'll be back in the near future to go to continue this, uh, getting into the 70s, and I can't wait to see what Ruel's come up with. So, uh, yeah. anything you've got in closing, or shall we? Uh, no, I'm, I'm looking forward. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the rest of the list here. I mean, we've knocked out 20 of the 100, and so far, all 20 fantastic yes. games. Like I, yeah. So I'm looking forward to the rest, the 80 of uh, that remained. Uh, but yeah, that, that's uh, gonna do it here. Um, I'll throw it back to you, Rado. Yep, I, I I agree. I am very proud of this list so far. You and I don't know what each other is going to come up with, but I don't think... Uh, I, I think we, we have nailed 20... I'm going to say 20 of the best game modern Euro board games there are period. And there's just going to, it's just going to get better folks. So, uh, you know, tune in and, uh, hopefully you will enjoy. And if you missed the first episode, uh, I think we mentioned right up front, you can find all episodes of the R and R show. Uh, there's a link down there at the bottom screen, rnr.rado.com. That's just a big old playlist. Um, this was episode 28. Oh my gosh, we've been doing this forever and we're going to keep on doing it because we've got another 80 games to talk about. We got a ways to go. <laughs> okay, folks. Well, thanks for watching. <laughs> Thank you, um, Ruel, for uh, putting in the time and coming up with awesome selections. And uh, most importantly, thank you to sponsors of the show, Floodgate Games. Thanks for watching, everybody. Talk to you later. So long. Uh, bye bye